Why hello there friends, it's Emma here, the Bookish Princess. Look, this is actually a shaft of light, but I feel like it like looks like it's part of my part of my sweatshirt. It kind of matches the, the sparkly sleeves. Also, you might be able to hear in the background my brother Dart is practicing his guitar. So I won't even need to add any background music to this video. Oh my gosh, did Athos just join on the drums? I am super excited about today's video. So every year I like to do a top 19, top 18, top 17 reads of the year. I've been doing it for the past five years now, and my top 19 books that I read in 2019 is coming up, so make sure you're subscribed and stay tuned for that. But this has been a really fun tradition, and it's actually really fun to look back on the videos from past years, because sometimes I think, oh my gosh, I forgot. I even read that in 2016. I should reread that, that was so good. So I was thinking, hmm, I wonder what will be on my list next year in 2020. What will the, the top 20 books of that year be? So I thought, hmm, that would be a fun video. I should make a list of 20 books that I'd like to read in 2020. Well, my list became pretty ambitious and looking over it, I realized that it would probably take far more than just a year to read it because it's full of classics, a lot of long classics. I just love to read classics. I feel like it's so fun to read books from previous generations, books from hundreds of years ago, because it's basically time travel. It's really magical that you can sit down and have a conversation with Plato or Chaucer or Shakespeare or Dostoevsky or authors from all different parts of the world, from all different eras of history. So anyway, today's video is going to be 20 classics I plan to read in the 2020s. See, I thought I'd give myself the whole decade. Hopefully it won't take that long. Maybe it will. By the end of the 2020s, who knows if YouTube will still be a thing. Maybe we'll all be on some brand new platform. I thought it would be really fun though to make this a tag video because it would be so fascinating to hear what other booktubers, what other people are planning to read, hoping to read, books that have always been kind of on the back of your TBR that looking over the next decade you would love to get to the end of the 2020s and say yes I finally got to that book that author so if you run a YouTube channel and you love books I hereby tag you to make one of these videos for yourself it doesn't have to be classics it could just be 20 books that I hope to read in the 2020s I think it would be so fun to see I have my list written down let's jump into it <laughs> So the first book on my list is one that I'm kind of surprised I haven't read yet. I feel like whenever it pops up on classics lists, I'm like, oh, I've got to read that. I've got to read that. Some of my brothers have already read it and they really like it. So I obviously have to read it so that I will be in on the references and so that we can quote it to each other. This book is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. I love really dramatic adventure tales from this kind of period. I love The Three Musketeers, which is also by Alexandre Dumas. This is the tale of, um, oh, what's his name? Gosh, I cannot remember the main character's name. I'm pretty sure it begins with a D. It's on the tip of my tongue. D, 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 oh. It's gonna really bug me. I'll probably put it in here in text on the screen since I can't think of it right now. Another French author and a French classic that I have on my list here is The Phantom of the Opera. There are so many stories that are still around in our culture and that have been retold in new ways, but like sometimes we've almost forgotten the original. Like last year I read the short story Pinocchio, which of course we have Disney's Pinocchio and people still know Pinocchio, the wooden puppet, but like you haven't necessarily read the original. It's by Carlo Collati, an Italian author. It's a super quirky, pretty quick, uh, children's read, but it was just so fun to go back and read that, so I think it'd be fun to go back and read the original Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. No one writes like Gaston, right? I do have a third French author here, and that is Marcel Proust. So he wrote uh, A la recherche de, des temps perdus. So that translates to In Search of Lost Time. It's actually a novel in seven volumes. I do not think I will get through all seven. I just feel like Proust is one of those authors whose name I hear pop up, who I sometimes hear people mention or quote, and I just would like to experience him for myself. So by the end of the 2020s, I would like to at least be able to say I have tried Proust, even if we don't end up getting along. Another author on here who I feel like I should be better friends with but somehow I'm not, is Evelyn Waugh. I think I have read his classic, Brideshead Revisited. 
I can't remember now though. I picked it up once and I was like, this seems really familiar, but now I'm wondering, did I just see the movie and maybe they did a good job with the movie? And so when I read the book, it felt very familiar. So I love the British author, P.G. Woodhouse. He is so funny, so lighthearted and hilarious and his characters are constantly dropping like classic illus illusions, but in like the most offhand way. See, I don't need to put P.G. Woodhouse on my list of 20 classics to read in the 2020s because I know I will read plenty of P.G. Woodhouse. He is like Jane Austen and Elizabeth Googe. I never have to remind myself to read those authors. They just sneak back into my TBR of their own accord. But yes, on a lot of my editions of P.G. Woodhouse, there's an Evelyn Waugh quote on the back and it's something like, something about how he may save future generations from an existence that may be even more irksome than our own. It's just a great quote. It has always made me feel like I should give Evelyn Waugh a fair chance. He wrote about the bright young things in England of the 20s and 30s. He actually converted to Catholicism. So the book I'm going to try by him is A Handful of Dust. And then we'll see after that, maybe I'll give Brideshead Revisited another go. One author on my list who I'm already very familiar with and, who's our, and who is already a dear friend and character who I feel like I know is Mark Twain. His voice in his novels is just so funny. I was recently reading his like travelogues from Europe. Um, oh, what's it? Innocence Abroad and oh, what's the other name of them? A Tramp Abroad, I think. But it's just really fun because he'll be talking about this beautiful scenery in Switzerland and then all of a sudden he's like reminiscing about something back in the United States. I've read a biography of him before and I really enjoyed learning more about his life. I've visited his hometown. But Mark Twain actually wrote his own autobiography. It was recently published in full. I think it's three huge volumes. So again, this is one I'm not sure I'll make it through all three volumes, although maybe I will. Maybe I'll love it. I feel like Mark Twain has so many interesting things to say. He's just got such a great sense of humor. Too. So I think his autobiography would just be hugely fascinating to read. See, the reason I made this video, 20 classics to read in the 2020s and not just in the year 2020 is because some of them are so long that it would be really challenging to get through them all in one year. And honestly, I might just try them. And if I don't love them, I won't finish them. There are just too many books to read to waste your time slogging through a book that you know you don't love and you're not getting a lot out of. You can always try it again later and maybe it'll speak to you more in a couple years. That happened to me with uh, Virginia Woolf. The first time I read Virginia Woolf, I was just like, wasn't really into it, but then later I came back and was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Anyway, this next author is like not at all related to Virginia Woolf. I would love to read St. Faustina's Diary. I'm a Roman Catholic. I love reading theology from all different faith backgrounds, um, but especially Catholic saints. St. Teresa of Avia is one of my favorites. I love her book, Interior Castle. St. Teresa of Avia actually had an autobiography that I haven't read. See, I knew this was going to be a problem when I talked about this list. I would be sneaking in all sorts of other books and it would end up being way more than 20. But St. Faustina, I have never read and I've heard her diary is just beautiful. It is very long and I think it will be kind of dense. Oftentimes, theology is dense like you have to really take it slow and let it soak in but I feel like it is just good for the soul you find so many beautiful things beautiful thoughts beautiful prayers one of my favorite St. Teresa of Avia prayers is let nothing dismay me let nothing disturb me all things pass God never changes he who has God finds he lacks nothing God alone suffices. I'm not super familiar with St. Faustina, but there are two ways that I know her, and if you're a Catholic, you might be familiar with these too. She actually had a vision that inspired the Divine Mercy painting of Jesus that you see often. It's like blue and red and white rays coming from his heart. It's so beautiful. Um, and she also created the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So it's a way to say the rosary, and the prayer goes, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. So I think it would be really cool to get to know St. Faustina better. So this next book isn't straight theology, but it does have some faith and spiritual themes in it. It is Kristen Laverne's Daughter by Sigrid Unset. Now this is another multi-volume, I'm pretty sure three volume tale. I have attempted the first volume and I got pretty far in it. I don't think I quite finished it. To be honest, I got fed up with Kristen, the main character. Just the choices she was making and the things she was doing, I was like, what are you thinking? But I shouldn't have given up because there were some really beautiful, really thought-provoking passages. It's one of those book names that I hear come up every now and then. I'm like, oh, I should give that another shot. I have read Paradise Lost 
by Milton, which is a classic work. It's really fun to have read these classics that you see quoted in other classics because it just makes you feel like there's this giant conversation going on and you're a part of it. That's one of my favorite things about reading is that I love books that reference other books because it just leads you on this wonderful adventure. You never run out of things to read. And I also love rereading because the second time you read something is often totally different from the first and you find so many new things. That's the reason I love Jane Austen so much. Every time I reread her books, I notice some scene, some phrase that I had never even paid attention to before that is completely beautiful. It sticks with me and inspires me or gives me courage and strength just in the normal course of everyday life. And Milton is such a classic author. I should probably go back and reread Paradise Lost as well because it's been a while, but I would also really like to read Paradise Regained. He did also write a second one, Paradise Regained. I also wrote down in here Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. I think this is mentioned in Little Women and in lots of other books, but it's been just another one of those ones that whenever I hear it mentioned, I'm like, oh, I should read that for myself one day. It's so funny when you think of like the books or like cultural sort of phenomenons that were common to, you know, a whole society that now I don't think very many people read Pilgrim's Progress now, but it is still kind of passed along to us by Little Women, by other books. My brother Porthos loves to read. I'm sure he will be watching this video eventually and he will be very proud of me because there are three Russians on it. Porthos loves Russian literature. He has read Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, which I have not read Anna Karenina. Over the years, I've done a pretty good job with Dostoevsky. I've been slowly chipping away. I've read, read Brothers Karamazov. I read The Idiot. I read Demons the other year. But Tolstoy, I think, War and Peace is the only one that I've read. So I feel like I really need to get to Anna Karenina. The only, the, the only version of Anna Karenina that I've read. Hold on, where is it? Ah, oh, is it over here? Where did I put it? I'm sure it's around. It's probably in the closet, you know? Aha! <laughs> it's this one. It's a picture book. Anna Karenina. It's a board book. Little Master Tolstoy by Jennifer Adams. Art by Alison Oliver. I bought this mostly because I thought the art was so beautiful. See, someday my kids can read it. Look at, that. Look at her in the winter snow. See, so just for the fashion, I feel like I should probably, uh, probably read Anna Karenina. I think some of these are like direct quotes. This is just such a cute series. If I if I was married, if I had kids, I would definitely have like all of the little master, you know, classics on um, on the shelf. This is a fashion primer. Yeah, obviously that doesn't count. <laughs> I need to read the original Tolstoy. And I do also have a Dostoevsky on here, Crime and Punishment. I have not read by Dostoevsky yet, so I think that would be great to tackle. And then the last Russian is Ivan Turgenev. And it is the book Fathers and Sons, and Porthos, my brother, has definitely inspired me. He's talked about this one a lot, and talked about how it's like influenced Dostoevsky and how the books are kind of interrelated and talk about the same themes. Another author whose works I would sort of like to check more off of is William Shakespeare. I read quite a lot of Shakespeare's plays, but there are still a couple, mostly the histories, I think, because there are like three Henry the Fourths, aren't there? And then Henry the Fifth and Richard the Second and Richard the Third. I think there are a couple of tragedies that I haven't gotten to yet as well. The comedies are the ones I like best, so I read most of the comedies. But I think that would be a great goal to just be able to say, yes, I have read all of the Shakespeare's at least once. I feel like I need to read them way more than once though, because it would be great to be able to quote them. You know, I just feel like there's a Shakespeare line to fit probably every situation, especially insults. I have like a mug from the, um, oh, what's that company called? The Unemployed Philosophers Guild that like has all sorts of Shakespearean insults on it, and it's pretty great. So a lot of these books I do not own yet, which obviously means I need more bookshelf space. I was talking about this in my last reading blog, and I was saying, ah, oh, you know, I don't really have space for more books. I already have a lot of books. I probably don't need to buy more books. I loved how one of you guys said in the comments, what are you talking about, Emma? You always need new books. You know what? You're absolutely right. Someday I would love to have a whole room just for books. You know, a library of my own. I would definitely fill it way too easily. It would not be good for my bank account. In fact, this list is not good for my bank account because I don't own most of these. Although, I do do a lot of library reading, especially when it's a book I'm not sure that I'm going to really love because I really only want books on my shelves that I'm going to want to reference or going to be tempted to reread. So if there's something I'm not positive about, I do usually start out with a library book. There are two titles, though, that are already on my shelves that I haven't gotten to yet, and those two are right down here. 
They are the Brontes. See, the Brontes are like Evelyn Waugh or Charles Dickens, one of those authors that I feel like I should be closer friends with. See, it's not like I don't like them or don't appreciate them or haven't read them. It's just, I feel like we should get along better than we do. <laughs> and maybe it's my fault. This this uh, beautiful edition I picked up at Barnes & Noble. I think it was on the sale section, so it was like $4. It has Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, and Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. I've read Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. I have not yet read Agnes Grey. And I hate having things on my shelves that I haven't read. I feel like this book has popped up in many of my booktube videos, and I've been like, I'm gonna read Agnes Grey this month, and then something else gets in the way, and I don't end up reading it. So in the 2020s, at some point, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna finish off, finish off reading this volume. And then the other book is also a multi-novel uh, volume. This is three novels of New York, The House of Mirth, The Custom of the Country, and The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. So this is, again, I've read two, The Custom of the Country and The Age of Innocence. I have never read The House of Mirth. So I need to finish breaking in this book properly and give The House of Mirth a chance. I read Edith Wharton's letters and actually I really loved those. I loved her voice better in those. In these, her novels often are very cold to me and I've talked about how, you know, I recognize that's really on purpose because the society she's talking about and writing about is a very cold, sort of shallow society. This, the tone of it just doesn't speak to me quite as much, but she is an amazing writer. So, so I think it'll be really fun to finally finish both of these uh, both of these books. All right, so we're nearing the end of the list. If you're familiar with my channel, you'll know that two things that I have fallen in love with over the past two years are Bollywood movies. So I've loved learning more about India and seeing all these beautiful Indian movies. It's been really fun to learn more about Indian culture. I have read a couple of Indian novels. I've read uh, A Suitable Boy. I'm reading Midnight's Children right now. But one book, or legend rather, that I would love to read is the Ramayana by Valmiki, I think, is, is the author they usually attribute it to. If any of you guys have a recommendation of a good English translation of the Ramayana, definitely let me know, definitely let me know down in the comments because I haven't picked out an edition yet. But I would just love to read the original tale because this is often a tale that's like worked into the movies or like a festival, or they might be retelling the tale in the lyrics of the song. And then the last books on my list are actually inspired by another world culture, this time South Korea. So I fell in love with the band BTS this year. I've just loved getting to know their personalities, listening to their music, appreciating their choreography, and like incredible, incredible performances. One of the things I love about them is that they actually incorporate these really incredible themes and sometimes authors into their works. Like their newest album, Map of the Soul, is based on Jung, Carl Jung, who I've been reading. They've had literary references in their works in the past as well. One of them is Demian by Herman Hesse, and I've never read anything by Herman Hesse, but again, he's one of those authors who you hear crap up, I feel like I should read something by him to get better acquainted. Since discovering BTS, I've also been discovering Korean culture and Korean food. I love the channel Korean Englishmen, which are actually British guys who are introducing Korean uh, food to other people. But whenever I discover a new culture, a new country, and become interested in it, I always want to start reading books by authors from that country. The way I've been trying to work more Indian authors into my uh, TBR pile. So I would love to work some Korean classics into my TBR as well. I was doing some research, and there were two titles that kind of stood out to me. The Nine Cloud Dream by Kim Man Young, or Jung. It's probably Jung, because Jungkook is not Jungkook, it's Jungkook. <laughs> this is a 17th century Korean novel set in Tang Dynasty, China. It's been called one of the most beloved masterpieces in Korean literature. And then the other one that I have here is The Memories of Lady Hyegyong. Whenever I've mentioned BTS in my, fast, in my past videos, I've always gotten a comment or two saying, oh, well, have you tried K-dramas? Because Koreans have absolutely incredible dramas and, and TV shows and TV series as well. And yes, I have been watching some K-dramas. I've been enjoying Love is a Bonus Book. Is that the name of it? It's something like that. It's kind of fun because it's set in like a publisher's house. So like there are lots of bookish bookish scenes. However, I also love the historical K-dramas. I just started watching a new one called Sassy Girl or, or something like that. It doesn't sound like it's a historical drama, but it is. And the other one was 
rookie historian Gu Heirung. They're both set in the past. They're set in, I think it's the Joseon period uh, in Korea's history, and they wear these beautiful traditional clothing called hanbok. Apparently, there are certain palaces in South Korea where if you visit them in hanbok, like you actually dress up, you get free admission. Isn't that amazing? Don't you wish Disney World was that way? If you came dressed up as a Disney character, they let you in for free? But no, at Disney World, it's the opposite because if you want to come dressed as a character, you have to pay more because you have to come to one of the Halloween parties. <laughs> I would love to visit Seoul and South Korea someday. And if I went, I would absolutely wear hanbok to one of those palaces. So anyway, the memories, the memoirs of Lady Hye Rung, Hye Gong, Hye Gyeong, Hye Gyeong are set during that time period. And just from the historical dramas, it seems like a really interesting um, period of history, a really cool culture that I would love to learn more about. And that was written in, hold on. So she lived from 1735 to 1816. I'm pretty sure now that that was more than 20 books, so. <laughs> But like I said, I would love to see what you guys would love to read in the next decade. I hope some of you will do this tag, tag your friends, spread the word. My 19 top books are coming up. Actually, I wrote that list on the back of my 2020 list. So depending on how I was, how I was holding the notebook, maybe you got a little sneak peek of it. If you're not subscribed yet, make sure you hit that button. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up. I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. I hope you have a very wonderful new year. Here's sending you all the good bookish wishes for the new year and for the new decade. That's about it for me for today. I hope you guys have a magical day and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye!